Hello friends, today we will discuss about the nature and scope of statistics and its role in studying economics. We come across various types of numerical data in the newspapers, advertisements and television in our daily life. We become curious to know what lies behind these numbers and statements in order to be properly informed citizens. We can only do so if we understand and evaluate these quantitative information. An understanding of statistics will help us decipher this information. To quote H. G. Wells, statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. Thus, a grasp of statistics has become a must in today's education so that we become aware of the statistical content in our course of economics at the higher secondary stage. For this, first of all, we need to understand the meaning of statistics. According to the Oxford Dictionary, Statistics used in plural sense means numerical facts systematically collected. Statistics used in the singular sense means science of collecting, classifying and using statistics or statistical fact or item. Now, let us understand what is meant by statistical methods of analysis. Statistical methods of analysis can be purely descriptive or probabilistic. However, at this stage we will only focus on descriptive statistics. The descriptive methods include collecting and classifying the data, presenting them in tabular and diagrammatic forms, calculating summary indices to measure certain characteristics of the data. Statistical data can be of two types, quantitative data and qualitative data. Let us understand the difference between quantitative and qualitative data. We have quantitative data if the variables can be measured in numerical terms, for example, daily temperatures, heights and weights of individuals, prices and incomes, etc. are quantitative variables. These values can be expressed numerically. In case of qualitative data, it is not possible to measure variables numerically. For example, attitude of people to a political system, intelligence of individuals, aptitude of people towards music and art, beauty of individuals, etc. cannot be measured numerically. However, we may rank them according to the quality of their attributes. We may compare two objects and say that A is more beautiful than B, B is more beautiful than C and so on. We may assign rank 1 to the most beautiful, rank 2 to the second best and so on. The lowest rank may be assigned to the least beautiful. The ranks may be used as numerical measurements for purposes of statistical analysis. Let us now discuss the scope of statistics in economics. Statistical data are used by us in everyday life. For example, while preparing the family budget for a month, we need data on prices of various goods and services to decide what proportion of our income should be allocated for various items of consumption like food, clothing, travel, schooling of children, etc. To take another example, the performance of students in an examination is described in terms of marks secured by them. 
we may also compare the performance of different schools in terms of the number of students passed in class 10th. How many got a first, second and third division and how many failed? Now, we need to understand the use of statistics in economics. Statistical data is used by economists for various purposes. Some of the important examples are number 1 to analyze the trends in prices of various goods and services, second to analyze consumption and production patterns in the economy, third to formulate suitable government policies for economic development, fourth to study relationship of sales and prices in business, fifth to determine fluctuations in the market, sixth to determine the magnitude of inventories to be held at a given point of time, seventh to analyze the relationship of inputs and outputs in industry and so on. Now the question is from where to obtain the data? The government is the largest data collecting agency who collects data on various demographic characteristics of the population through census like birth and death rates, size and composition of the population, etc. In addition, it collects data on income, consumption, industrial and agricultural production, education, employment, health, etc. It is said that the government is the biggest consumer as well as the producer of statistical data. It is because the governments also need information on various aspects for planning and administration. Friends, you need to be careful about the possibilities of errors in statistics. There may be errors in statistical relations due to omitted variables. For example, let us consider the relationship of quantity demanded of a certain commodity and its price. We know that the quantity demanded decreases as its price increases, but the change in the quantity demanded may also occur if income changes. Size of the family, tastes of people, etc also affect the quantity demanded. If we are considering the relationship of quantity demanded with price alone, ignoring the effect of the other variables, the relationship is bound to be in error. Let us take another example. Suppose we are examining that by what proportion would the demand for a certain commodity decrease if its price increases by 1 percent. Intuitively, we can say that the quantity demanded of the commodity would decrease if its price increases, but the proportion of change in demand would depend upon whether it is a necessary good like salt, rice, etc. or a luxury item like a TV or a refrigerator. Thus, as we have seen that the error in the relationship may arise due to omitted variables. Friends, you should know that the statistical methods need to be used cautiously. There is also a danger of misuse of statistical methods. First of all, the quality of data plays an important part in statistical analysis. Fallacies may arise if we are using the data which are either insufficient or unrepresentative or incomparable. There are some examples given here. If we want to test the efficacy of a certain drug, we must test it in a number of cases. If we jump on the conclusion by examining the effect in very few cases, we are likely to make mistakes. Similarly, 
if we want to estimate the average income of people living in town and base our estimate on incomes of people living in rich areas only, we get an overestimate. Secondly, the vagueness in definitions and concepts employed in data collection may also lead to wrong calculations. For example, if we are collecting data on the income of households, we must make clear how we intend to calculate the required income. People with fixed wage or salary income may be able to give a correct answer, but a businesswoman does not have a fixed income. Her income varies from month to month and she may not maintain accurate records of her income regularly. Then, how do we calculate her income? To take another example, suppose we are calculating data on employment. There are many people who may be employed only for a part of a day or a month. How should we measure their employment? Friends, statistical methods are no substitutes for common sense. To elaborate the point, I will narrate an anecdote. An epidemic broke out in some village of a state. The government took immediate steps to control the epidemic. Doctors were sent with medicines for medical assistance. The person who collected the data found that the number of deaths were larger in those villages which had larger number of doctors. He thus concluded that doctors were responsible for deaths and they should be punished. Friends, what do you think? One more caution, statistical methods should not be used blindly. Here is another anecdote. A family of four persons, husband, wife and two children, once set out to cross a river. The father knew the average depth of the river, so he calculated the average height of his family members. Since the average height of his family members was greater than the average depth of the river, he decided to cross the river with his family. Consequently, his children drowned while crossing the river. Friends, where did the mistake lie? In statistical method? or in use of the method. Thus, statistical fallacies or statistical lies arise due to wrong handling of the data or because of ignoring the underlying assumptions or by misusing certain summary indices as we have just seen. Study of statistics helps to develop statistical thinking. Statistical thinking deals with the quantitative characteristics of mass of data and differences within the mass. For example, the total labor force in India consists of a set of working people who could be differentiated according to occupation, industry, sex, rural and urban, age, marital status, earnings and so on. There is variation in each of these aspects and the study of these variations is the chief concern of the statistical thinking. To conclude, statistical thinking is a form of logical thinking and is a part of our daily lives. When we say that something or somebody is typical, we are thinking in terms of statistical averages and the departure from typical is statistical variation. When we generalize from few cases to a very large number, we are using sampling methods. A conclusion that two things always go together involves a part of thinking found in statistical correlation. When we mention that the cost of living has gone up by 20 percent in a certain period, we are thinking of index numbers. Friends, statistical thinking is not alien to everyday thinking, but is a scientific form of it. 
statistics has thus become increasingly a fundamental activity of our social, economic and political life. Friends, hope this will give you an idea of nature, scope and use of statistics in economics.